Al Lyman, a warm welcome to the Humans versus Retirement podcast. Dan, thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to join you today and, uh, and talk about all things aging and health span and longevity. I'm super excited to be here. Yeah, I can't wait, Al. Um, I, I, I came across, I think it was uh, just some random LinkedIn post that you put in and it, it, it come across my, um, my feed. And soon as I saw that post and I saw your headline, the age optimizer and Googled you, which we always do, right? We kind of, when we see someone of interest, we Google them, of course, um, yeah. looked at your website, which we linked in all the show notes. I thought I've got to get Al on the podcast because one of the biggest non-financial elements of a long and happy retirement is health and our health and how we view ourselves and how we can increase our health span, increase our longevity, increase our energy, I think changes over time. And it's often an ignored element of living a healthy long life. So I can't can't wait to to kind of get stuck into your your knowledge, um, both working with people in that area, but also yourself. And, and I'm sure we'll get into your nine Ironmans that you've completed at some point during yeah. this conversation. So it's coming yeah. from a personal struggle and journey of training as well, right? Absolutely. You know, and I have to say, Dan, I as soon as I heard from you, I loved the title of your podcast, which is to say the humans versus the retirement, because in my world, the word retirement is really not my favorite word, right? I mean, uh, I always think it's so much about getting up every day and having a mission and a purpose and a reason to get back, uh, get up out of bed that really drives all of us. So uh, I was excited to get your note and I'm looking forward to our conversation. Perfect. Yeah. I it's that um, as someone who specializes in working with people that are approaching and dealing with, the, you know, and going into retirement, I've said it many times, if I could ban the word, I'd love to ban the word. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. But I think what I'm looking to do is re-engineer it and make it mean something different. Um, so. so we're on the same page there. Um, and we'll probably come back to that, I think, which is quite an interesting, an interesting conversation to, to, to have. Um, Al, to kick off, you, you, I really want to just get your view on, and I, I know you, you, you wrote a really, really good blog on this, and I've wrote something on it and done a drawing and a sketch on this, but the, the definition of kind of health span and lifespan, what, what, you know, I think we often get caught up in this, um, we're living longer, but our health span is, I think anyway, more important than lifespan because that is the, the energy and the activity and everything that we can do. Have you got any thoughts around that and, and that as a topic? Well, for sure, Dan, I, you know, it's interesting uh, in this day and age where there is uh, a lot of focus on certainly modern medical technology and pharmaceuticals and things like that, that extend potentially uh, the length of our lives, right? Give us more years. But I know in my experience in, in looking around and, you know, certainly seeing uh, folks in my circle and um, even in the world at large, uh, drawing that distinction between the quality of our years, our ability to really enjoy our lives and whatever and however long we're here, versus just a number, which is to say, this is how long I've lived or how long a certain person lived. Uh, to me, there are uh, dramatically um, and important differences between the two. And I'll share just a personal little uh, anecdote. Um, this past week, my mom passed away. Uh, and I write about my mom quite a bit in, in my book, Age Well and Feel Great, specifically in the epilogue of the book. And when she passed this past January, uh, she was 93. And of course, when someone hears, you know, that someone lived until 93, their first reaction is, wow, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, what a life. And certainly, uh, I've enjoyed having my mom around. Um, and her grandkids and great grandkids as well enjoyed having her up until uh, this past week. But what most people don't know is that my mom suffered greatly, actually, for for decades. Uh, in fact, in my mind, there's no 
logical reason why she would have lived as long as she did. But we know that a lot of life and health is a mystery. Um, so in the book, I write about this idea, or I should say this question that I asked my mom, and it was literally about 20 years ago. And I asked her, uh, mom, what would you do differently today if you knew that you were going to live to be 100, but you weren't guaranteed of good health along the way? And she scoffed at me and kind of stiff armed me and pushed me away. And um, the reality is that, you know, her suffering and the quality of the years and how much her ill health impacted everybody in the family and created um you know, I have to say a little bit of resentment and difficulty with my siblings and all the adjustments, uh, you know, in their lives to to care for my mom. I mean, to be a caregiver, you know, takes such a huge heart, but it's a tremendous responsibility. You know, in the book, I say that the very last thing any of us would want is to be a burden on those we love the most, especially at a point in their lives when they want to enjoy themselves as well. So we've got this really strange uh, juxtaposition of length of life versus the quality of the years. I know for myself, Dan, you know, uh, there's there's so much to enjoy about about life, our relationships getting outside in nature, social activities, um, meaningful work and a purpose and all of these things. But in my mind, none of that is possible without good health. Fundamentally, having good health, right? Um, in, let's say delaying the onset of chronic disease for as long as possible and compressing that period of time of suffering and where, we're, where we are, uh, not of our own choosing, a burden on, on those we least want to burden. To me, that is really uh, what I want to focus on and what I try to help people understand. And, and listen, I'm going to be honest with you. I mean, who wouldn't want to live as long as possible? I mean, I'd be a fool to say I wouldn't want to live a long life. Uh, but to me, the quality of the years is what matters the most. And And the truth is, is that we have a tremendous amount of control over uh, the quality of our life and the quality of our, our years, and at least giving ourselves the best opportunity to extend that health span and compress that period of suffering or illness um, versus, you know, what my mom experienced. Uh, so I sit here right now, I mean, I have a lot of emotions going uh, through me because you can imagine, and you know, you're a very intuitive guy in the short time that we've had a chance to meet, I think you understand. You know, here I am, a guy who wrote a book who's been so passionate about this topic and living my literally my entire life to learn what it would take to create good health over a lifespan, to extend health span. Uh, and yet I was able uh, to sit back and watch my mom suffer in the way that she did. And my the book is dedicated to my dad who passed uh, at 65 from cancer uh, 23 years ago. So uh, we've got this uh, strange uh, juxtaposition where my mom suffered for, for decades without my dad, without her soulmate, without the person uh, she loved more than any other uh, and suffered dearly along the way. You know, Dan's crazy. My mom, we sat, uh, we sat once and counted it up. My mom has been under the knife, uh, actually in the operating room 48 times. And I say she, she has been, of, of course, She's now passed, but uh, just just a small little snippet of the suffering that she went through, because that's a lot of needle pricks. That's a lot of blood draws. Uh, that's a lot of anesthesia. Um, there's so much, I think, that she could have done to uh, to lessen that suffering. But, you know, it's a mystery why we make the choices that we make. Um, and I think there's a lot of reasons for it. We'll talk about it, I'm sure, in this conversation. So. Yeah, to me, and I know you feel the same way, it is about the quality of the years. Oh, um, quite a really moving st story. I'm so sorry to hear about y your mother and thank you for sharing that. I mean, that's resonated hugely with me and um, yeah, I know it's going to resonate hugely with, 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 with the listeners. So I massively appreciate that. Thank you. And, and, and I think, it absolutely chimes into the conversations that I have with people. It, it, a couple of points that I think will 
really kind of resonate with you and, and the listeners. It, it's I often hear that well, I don't want to be a financial burden to my children in later life. And my comment back is, what about the emotional burden? What about the physical burden? What about the so? You know, people concentrate on the numbers, but actually, if you can take care of yourself, as you said, you know, not you're not going to be the emotional potentially the emotional burden or um or, or the time burden that you might be on your children if you if you're in good health for as long as you possibly can so i think that's a really really interesting point to get across to the listeners or, 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 or on that you you know you're not only taking care of yourself but you're kind of taking care of the ones that you love and and, and cherish at the same time sure um and your point about the financial burden is is real dan because um, you know, just as a quick aside, uh, I have a very good friend and, and listen, we don't want to make this whole conversation about, you know, about sadness, but I, I tell the story in the book of about, about a very good friend who passed, uh, from, from prostate cancer. It was diagnosed initially as prostate cancer. Uh, he was 54 and he passed about six months ago. And of course I wrote the book probably about a year and a half ago now, but, um, he had over a hundred chemotherapy treatments, um, and uh, I knew from speaking to his uh, wife that the total cost for the treatments that he endured uh, and all and all of the, the care involved in managing his disease and trying to help him uh, just simply to extend the length of his life a little bit totaled over a million dollars. And I think for you and I, we can sit here now and go, you can spend your whole life earning money and collecting assets, uh, and in the end, give it all back to try to chase a few more weeks or months of the kinds of opportunities. You know, I, I like to say, if we, Dan, if we could see our memories in advance, would we do something differently, right? Like, if he could have seen, you know, what he was going through in advance of having been diagnosed and he would he would fully admit if he were here today as, as he told me when we talked uh that it was about for him early diagnosis he simply didn't get the checkups didn't see the doctors didn't uh you know raise his hand when he had symptoms that would have given him uh, a better chance to survive uh, but imagine seeing your memories in advance you know for our listeners think for one moment uh what it what it's like to ha have every person in your life have their lives dominated by caring for you and, and watching all of your assets go away or become, uh, you know, I mean, God, the Medicare, Medicaid world is vicious. Um, so there, there are so many, so many prices to pay emotionally, financially, uh, and they are for, in many instances, at the very least, uh, things that we can delay. Um, you know, and I, I, I want to acknowledge uh, even before we go on that, you know, as I sit here, I thought about this every day of my adult life. Um, but I know that there's a lot of mystery, uh, you know, as to why certain people get sick and other people don't. Um, but I but I have to say the science unequivocally is clear in that 80 percent of our health outcome is really a product of our lifestyle choices over a great length of time. And there's a lot of things involved in that. Right, the dangers of modern living and the and the exposures to our environment, many of which we're not aware of. You know, I tell my significant other, don't carry your cell phone around with you all day. Put it away. You know, mm -hmm. uh, don't keep it near the bed at night. We don't know the impact of things like that or microplastics. Mm -hmm. But it's also, you know, 80-20 rule comes into play here. It's about the food we eat and the exercise we're able to get. Um, and these things have a huge impact on our opportunities to create the best outcome for ourselves yeah yeah absolutely on that theme then let, let's kind of go into you know some some maybe some practicalities around some of your work that you've done with your clients and what you've seen with with people um what what are i suppose two two questions in one here al for you and and, and answer what you um, what you feel, but what, what steps then can people start to take in retirement to boost their energy and keep active? And alongside that, kind of what are some of the keys to living that kind of long, happy and healthy, um, uh, as you kind of say, second phase or victory lap retirement or, um, you know, what, what are some of the you know practical things that you can 
that you can kind of divulge from your work that you've done? Well, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot. There's a huge talk. there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I think, Dan, um, and as you, uh, I, as I think you're aware, my my primary background as a therapist as a, and as a coach and certainly as an athlete is, is um, endurance sports and strength and conditioning. So exercise is really my background. But I, but I say in my book, and I really believe this, that the most important uh, factor in uh, determining our health outcome is the food that we eat. And the reality is that we live in an age where, um, quite honestly, Dan, profits drive a lot of what's happening in the food industry and in the pharmaceutical industry. Processed industrialized food is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. The messages that we're getting are to eat this food morning, noon, and night. So I think from a practical standpoint, what I what I usually suggest to people is let's begin to look at what it is that you're eating. And if you could just make one change, it would be to focus on eating real food versus something that's processed. It sounds really simple. And by the way, small changes are, are, are where to start always and forever. Yeah. You know, if you try to make a change over, you know, if you overhaul your diet in one night or embark on this really aggressive exercise program, you're, you're, you're absolutely bound to fail. But I think when I use the simple phrase, real food versus processed food, and I ask people to consider what's on a food label, the longer it is, the more processed it is. Where did a food come from? Did it come from the ground? Is it animal sourced from another animal um, versus something that's in a box or a package? It's cliche to talk about our grocery stores and the idea that what's around the perimeter is where we want to focus. And that's absolutely true. So from a practical standpoint, here's something so simple. One food that you typically eat that's processed in some way, shape or form, try to remove that food. Just that one thing. And if we can do that, then we can build upon it. Inevitably, it comes back to sugar. You know, when we look at chronic disease, Dan, and this is across the board, whether we're talking about dementia, including Alzheimer's or, Park or Parkinson's or uh, ALS, uh, i.e. Lou Gehrig's disease, or we look at cancers uh, from all types, when we look at cardiovascular disease, um, when we look at any of these chronic diseases, the diseases that are killing us, that are shortening our health span, um, all of these diseases have a central linchpin. This is what the science is showing us. And that central linchpin is metabolic health. That is to say how our body produces and utilizes energy, what happens in those little cell uh, organisms, organelles inside our cells called mitochondria. So what do I mean by that? I'm coming back to sugar. I'm coming back to processed sugar, how our body uh, handles that sugar that comes into our body, how that sugar increases the secretion of insulin, the master hormone, which is secreted by the pancreas to lower our blood sugar in response to eating sugar. Elevated levels of insulin are absolutely ubiquitous across all of these chronic diseases. In my book, in chapter nine, titled Insulin uh, Resistance and Hyperinsulinemia, I say insulin resistance is at the root of virtually all chronic diseases. So again, from a practical point of view, just take one processed food and replace it with some kind of a real food, right? If you can, just one thing. And along with that, Really be honest and look at the amount of sugar that's coming into your body and the hidden sources of the sugar because it's in all processed food. So at the end of the day, if we can come back to looking at, you know, foods and I, you know, I'm a big believer in the quality of animal sourced foods as being a tremendous source of nutrients. I'm a big believer that we should never remove uh, entire food groups from our diet. I believe human beings are omnivores. We need plants and fruits to some degree, of course, but we need uh, and, and benefit from the nutrients that are in uh, animal sourced foods as well. So from a very practical point of view, again, real food versus processed food. Now, when we talk about exercise, we all have a different starting. And it's, it's absolutely undeniable that exercise, which I think of as hormetic stress or hormesis, which is to say, 
What doesn't kill us makes us stronger. The human body thrives on physical stress, right? We're all, I mean, as we age, we're like, we can't wait to get to the point where we can retire and make things easier on ourselves, right? And we already have easy lives compared to what really we, we should have, right? We're from the garage door opener to the remote control. It's cliche, but the human body thrives on physical stress. We need it in order to remain healthy. So we're all at a different starting point. And I would say, listen, if you're on the couch and largely sedentary, then five minutes of consistent walking where you try to get a little bit out of breath could be a huge game changer for you. Uh, certainly if someone's listening and they're already resistance training, but perhaps they may not be doing any, what I think of as cardiovascular exercise where they're elevating their heart rates for say 15 or 20 minutes. So that could be benefit. Maybe somebody's going to yoga right now, but they're not doing resistance training. So these are the things, you know, again, one tiny little change, not going from being sedentary to saying, Hey, I'm going to start a running program. That would be crazy right? That would be a recipe for disaster because injury is lurking right around the corner. Um, tiny little changes where we're just willing to do something so small or seemingly so small that it's almost no change at all. And then back it up because consistency in all of these things is the key. And I'll stop there by just simply emphasizing that point. It isn't about, you know, the 30 minutes of exercise that I do today and then I don't do anything for 10 days. It's about five minutes that I can do today that I can back up every day without even thinking about it. It becomes part of my lifestyle, becomes a habit, becomes an automatic way in which I function. And the same is true with food, right? If we can get that one single tiny, like maybe it's that small bag of potato chips that we, that, that we had left over from, you know, the deli that we visited. Get it out of your house. And the next time you go to the deli, don't make that choice. Just that one decision. And you're going to say, Dan, and a lot of the listeners are going to say, well, all right, well, there isn't, isn't there an easier way? I mean, isn't there a hack? I mean, no, at the end of the day, you know, small changes, but you have to decide it's worth it. You know, you have to choose your heart, Right making a decision, even a small one about the food we eat or the exercise we get is hard, changes hard. But I would argue suffering with chronic illness, suffering with dis, you know, dysfunction and pain that's debilitating. Those are all so hard. So we've got to choose our heart to some degree, make it as easy on ourselves as we can. Uh, but there's no quick fix or hack that's going to create the change that we really need. Yeah, I'd I, I love it. Absolutely fantastic. So much to take away there. I think the, the, the human brain is naturally lazy, right? So it's always going to go to the path of least resistance. And if you, you let it, if you let it take over, you're going to sit on your couch. Um, yeah. and, and I think one of the things I do want to kind of get your take on, and, and, and again, in, in, in your work coaching your clients, because um, I say, I mean, you, you know, you, you, it, it, on your website, it, it, it says that it's um, aspiring aging adults that, you know, that, and I think that's amazing um, that, that, you know, in, in terms of the, the people that you that you work with to take back their health, optimize their age, live stronger. Um, another phrase on your website that I love is beat the doctor dance and take back your health. I mean, I think that's so, so cool. Um, but kind of with, with that in mind, I think if we, if you know, the, the journey of stepping back from either a successful business that you might exit or, um, or, or kind of a corporate career um, that, that you've had, there has to be, as I think, as you've said, there has to be intention, doesn't there? There has to be an intention to do stuff. What I've seen people do is actually have a reasonably healthy um, time when they're in corporate world. They've got a routine, they've got a structure, they've got, they play squash or um, they, you know, they, they do things um, in, in, in some social time. Yet that they leave that environment and the easiest thing to do is then order the takeaway, is to then watch the te television, is to drink that extra glass of wine, that bottle of beer, um, because it feels like then time's a bit. So I think maybe in retirement, you need to be even more intentional than you were in your working career. Is that something that you you kind of come across um, working with, kind of coaching your clients? Absolutely, Dan. You know, um, 
one of the things that I catch myself saying all the time is that what most people think of as good health isn't. And I think the first thing to remember is that, you know, chronic disease is largely insidious and it doesn't manifest symptoms until it's had an opportunity in many instances to grab hold within our body. And I know a lot of our listeners, and I know this is true because, uh, because it's true with the, the folks that I work with. You know, they latch on to the one thing that they might do. You know, you, you mentioned going, you know, and playing squash. You know, I've had so many people say to me, well, you know, I go to the gym three times a week. And as that person is sharing that with me, I can see that they've got a significant amount of visceral fat and a little bit of a pot belly. Or I, I know that they, you know, have got a drinking habit. They, it may only be one or two drinks a day, but it's consistent day in and day out. So they tend, you know, we tend to latch onto those one or two things that we feel like we're doing well and kind of ignore the things that we're not doing as well um, as we could be. And so one of the things that I try to do with the folks that I coach is uh, we start by saying, let's get a good baseline of everything. Let's get some blood work. Let's see where things like triglycerides are. Let's look at what your level of chronic inflammation is. The best marker for that is something referred to as C-reactive protein or HSCRP, because chronic inflammation is absolutely at the root of so much chronic disease. Let's get some blood work. Let's really see where you're at. Let's take account of the medications that you're now taking. Let's start by seeing if we can undo some of the damage of some of these things that exist right now. For a lot of folks, Dan, it's about weaning them off medications that I don't believe uh, or that I help them understand that they, they could do without because there are so many side effects to medications like statins to control cholesterol, which uh, a statin is, to be very honest with you, a poison. Uh, its singular goal is to lower LDL cholesterol, what we think of as bad cholesterol. But the reality is the downstream effects of a statin are, are disastrous for our health. It's my opinion, but it's backed up by a significant amount of science. So the point being, you know, we can sometimes be taking medications that mask a symptom or create more symptoms. And now we're like a dog chasing our tail, trying to figure out what's going on. So I love to start with this idea of, hey, what can we stop doing that may be creating some long-term effects we don't desire? And then how can we get a really good baseline of exactly where you are right now, right? Looking at blood work, looking at lifestyle. And of course, listen, and we talked about this briefly earlier, I think before we went live. You know, there's uh, mindset is everything, because I think most people, when challenged, would say that they're afraid of the unknown, that their brains are fearful of what may happen as the result of X, Y or Z. So it's kind of our human nature to step back and go, you know, I'm just going to stay the way I am, because at least I know where I am. Right. Until it's too late. And then we can't. Right. Go back. Um, so I work so hard uh, to try to help people to foster a belief in the power of their choices. And, and again, tiny little changes. Let's not overhaul everything at once, but let's try this one thing and see what kind of effect it has. And let's monitor by looking again at blood work, uh, which I do uh, frequently with folks. Let's look at these numbers. Let's talk about what they really mean. And again, working with healthcare providers where I can, uh, because I think that at the end of the day, we've got to work together uh, to help ourselves to get to a point where we have more control, where we feel like we have more control. And it's it's an incredible feeling. Uh, I mean, it's so gratifying to work with somebody who started out on 10 medications, mm -hmm. literally, right? Because most folks my age, I'm 64, most, most folks my age are on a half a dozen medications, right? They're on a high blood pressure, hypertension medication. They may be on a statin to lower cholesterol. They may be on an anxiety drug of some kind, and I could go down the list. But it's incredibly gratifying to, to, to reach a point after a few months where I can get somebody to the point where they're on none of those medications. Uh, and along with it, their energy has come back. And along with it, their ability to sleep through the night, get at least six hours of quality sleep. Because, man, for someone my age, uh, we, we don't sleep you know, to the degree that we need to, and sleep is so important. So anyway, I could go on, as you know, I'll stop there.
No, I, I, we'll come back to sleep in a second. I, I, something just come to me. I saw um, as you were talking through that and, and back to your point about uh, sugar and like small steps. I saw something on, uh, it must be true because it's on Twitter, right? So, or X, so it must be true. <laughs> I, I think it is true. Um, but I saw something that basically uh, one bottle of Coke, full fat Coca-Cola every day it equates to a equates to a calorie intake of one and a half stone which uh, i mean i find amazing you know yeah. it's that and 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 if you think that like, you know, over a year that is right so you know if you drunk one bottle of coke every day for a year one small kind of 500 yeah. mil bottle of coke yeah that's one and a half stones oh, we work in stones over here so what, I don't know what yeah. that is in pounds. Yeah, yeah. Um, of course. But, uh, yeah, one and a half stones of of excess weight, right? Just think about, I mean, if you drink a bottle of Coke a day and you replace that with water, I mean, that just fundamental foundational yeah. shifts. And, and again, like you're saying, one thing I absolutely subscribe to and love is that I think a lot of people kind of enter their retirement quite rightly with this kind of get-go mindset. And they, 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 they're like, right. I've got vigor, let's go, what we're going to do. And actually, what I, one of the challenges I, I find is that they often go too hard, too fast. And there isn't this kind of foundational, you know, as you said, blood work, what works, what doesn't, um, what daily habits can I do? I've probably got more time on my hands to cook fresh food. Um, if I want to learn new skills, I can learn how to cook, I can learn about this stuff. So, you know, I think everything, to me, if, if you kind of plot it out, plan it, take your time um, uh, uh, around it, you, you can really make some material differences, can't you, in a, in a, in a very short space of, of time if, if you're... Yeah, if you're, absolutely. You know, it, it is, I mean, listen, we, we all have this inclination to, once we make a decision, you know, to want to, you know, just eat the entire thing, right? And just, yep. just, just jump right in. But yeah. What we're really looking for, what I look for with every person I work with, Dan, is a true transformation to a different lifestyle. Yeah. Uh, and it's a different uh, set of beliefs, honestly and truly. And, you know, one of the things as an aside that I, that I, um, I work with folks uh, and encourage them to do, and for some people it's really hard, uh, but I ask, I ask each a person I work with to journal every day. Uh, and talk about the things that they're grateful for and acknowledge what I call their why, which is the, to say the reason why they're making the choices uh, that they're making, because your why is everything, right? Where do you want to be and what are the experiences you want to have and what are the memories you want to create? Uh, and, and so uh, the journaling process, along with, you know, rejuvenation and reflecting, uh, is also a part of it, right? It isn't just about get out the hammer and now your body becomes a nail or your habits become a nail and you just hammer away because that's not sustainable over the long term. But what is sustainable are tiny changes and revisiting why you're doing the things you're doing and challenging your belief systems to think differently about the aging journey. You know, one of the things I say in my book, Dan, just as an aside, is I hate the phrase anti-aging. When I see somebody on LinkedIn and I see in their profile, you know, anti-aging this or that, um, I immediately become skeptical and I really am not interested in what that person has to say. Because to me, that phrase glorifies youthfulness and it sort of emphasizes this idea that I can hack my way to being younger. You know, the, the truth of the matter is what we all want to do is embrace every chapter of our life for what it can offer to us if we're willing to do the things we need to do to create our best opportunity, right? So uh, ageism and aging stereotypes, uh, which I write about a lot in my book, uh, it's so important. You know, as I sit here at 64, I know I'm never going to run as fast as I did when I was 30. I mean, there are no more... 239 Boston marathons in my body. That is for sure. <laughs> uh, but I can tell you that uh, I know for me to live the kind of life I want to live now and be in the present and not, you know, lament the past and be sad about what's gone and it's never going to be or to be anxious about the future and when my day will come to live my best life today. Right. I know I need to embrace what it means to be. What's the best part of being 64 and how can yeah. I embrace that? Yeah. 
and celebrate achievement still. Right? I think that a part of the human brain, isn't it, is that that kind of the biases that we have around anchoring ourselves to certain things. You know, yeah. a three thirty nine marathon by sixty four year old Al Lyman or a four hour marathon by sixty six year old Al. Lyman, that's that's amazing, right? It, you kind of it, it's about the here and now and and yeah. and, and setting those those um, one hundred percent that yeah. those things. I've done a three fifty nine marathon, so. Um, Good for and you. I yeah, and I, yeah, I mean, obviously not it's quite. It's 26 that. miles anywhere you can. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, so, Al, what, I'm, I'm really inter interested in, um, I, I, I suppose, understanding from you some of the signs around the, and, and, and it could be problems, but it also could be ways to help those problems. So a, a lot of, um, a, a, a lot of, people will look up and read about i think if they do any type of research about aging which a lot of people i work with end up doing they they end up doing some sort of research about aging and you'll get muscle mass bone density um mental capacity uh come up and i think i think there is a there's some sort of fearfulness about strength and resistance training as you get older it's kind of like oh what, what if i'm I don't need to bodybuild. Well, that's complete rubbish. You know, lip, your strength training or weight training. Um, so, yeah, just around that, the, the, the kind of the way that maybe as you get older, muscle mass decreases, bone density, and then obviously the impact on maybe our mental capacity. I, I, yeah. I know you've got lots of thoughts around that. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, first of all, um, I'm doing, uh, interestingly, a webinar um, this coming Monday evening, and it'll be recorded for any folks in the UK uh, who won't be able to be live at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, called Stronger After 50, uh, where I'm going to talk specifically about how we can, in the safest and most efficient way possible, hold on to as much muscle uh, as is possible. So, you know, you opened a, a certainly, uh, you know, a broad and incredibly important topic, which is the effect of sarcopenia, which is a word that describes the loss of muscle uh, as we age. And what's, what's so important about the, that loss of muscle is the downstream effects to every aspect of our health, including our mental health uh, and, right, you know, and our risk for chronic disease. Uh, every day, the science is showing us that uh, things like, uh, I'll use the word myokines, which is a chemical that is released from uh, muscle that has a direct impact on the health of the rest of our body. I mean, there are literally dozens of positive effects that come out of uh, strength and muscle mass. So it is unequivocally the most important thing. The challenge is for every individual person is uh, how do we get started? And in my book, I present the simplest and easiest way to get started, which is with isometric strength training. You don't need equipment, you don't need a gym. All you need is the basic understanding how to apply a couple of really uh, uh, simple principles. It's a great way to get started. But I'll tell you, you know, one of the things I'm gonna talk about on Monday, I, I don't like the term lift weights. And this is something you hear all the time. Oh, you gotta lift weights. Well, you know, for, for a 55 year old woman who's never, strength trained in her life before, what on earth does that mean? Uh, well, she'll and she'll just say no, won't she? She won't do it. So that's, that's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, but there, there's two reasons why I dislike the term. One is it's not about the term connotates that we need to do something to the weight. Uh, and the reality is that's not what we're doing. We have to do something to our muscles with whatever tool we're going to use. I don't care. It could be our own body. I mean, I can literally sit here and just clamp my hands together and squeeze hard for 10 seconds. And my intent and my effort will then induce some kind of an effect on my muscle. That is super safe to do um, and easy to do. So I don't like that term for that reason. But the second uh, way, reason I don't like it is you know, inevitably in the fitness industry, we skip the basics and fundamentals and we go straight to the more challenging things. You know, it frightens me when I think about, you know, someone who's never strength trained before going into a gym and they get introduced to a barbell or they're doing box jumps. And I, you know, I, I go, oh, my God, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, uh, injury is right around the corner. And the, and the downside, of course, the injury is that you lose your 
whatever motivation or inspiration you had, uh, you, you immediately blame yourself. You become sad and then you say, I'm never going to do that again. Um, so everything I've done as a, as a fitness professional uh, and as a strength and conditioning coach and an endurance sports coach has been about establishing uh, basic and fundamental skills, uh, building stability, looking at joint uh, articulation and range of motion, and just maintaining those things. And, and the truth is that all of these things are very accessible to us. They don't require a high uh, skill level to perform. We just need the right kind of guidance. I give some of that in my book, but I open all of these things to the folks that I coach. So I give them you know, a little bit to chew on at a time in a way that they can feel good about their progress. And along the way, they're building uh, fundamental movement skills. Uh, and again, going back to what we talked about earlier, they're using it so they don't lose it fundamentally. But mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I'm going to talk about many of these things uh, on Monday night. Listen, if we're going to strength train at, our, at my age, it's got to be safe. It's got to be convenient. It's got to be easy to perform, or should I, I should say simple. Um, of course, effort is required. You know, effort is the great equalizer. You know, just by looking at a weight, we're not going to get stronger, or looking at, you know, whatever tool we're going to use. Uh, and, and unequivocally, with the folks that I work with one-on-one, -on -one, uh, the thing they learn from me is that they're, they're capable of much more effort than they realize. So we can do five or 10 minutes of concentrated effort. They'll get tremendous benefit from it. But inevitably, they say, you know, I was working a lot harder with you than I worked on my own. And I'm going, OK, well, guess what? This is what you got to bring home uh, for yourself. Uh, but of course, it's got to be done. And we've got to use a modality that uh, where the risk of injury is zero. Right. Yeah. It's nil uh, so that that person can continue to build momentum and progress and then uh, reap the benefits of that. And I'll say one last thing about bone density, which is hugely important. So when we put tension into muscle and that muscle pulls on tendons and then on ligaments, which attach that soft tissue or connective tissue to our bones, our bones become stronger. And in combination with some kind of gravity-based exercise like walking or hiking, or dare I say running, uh, not for the great majority, uh, of course, um, these things are what help us to hold on to bone density. Virtually every folk person that I work with, at some point during our journey, uh, I have them go through uh, what's referred to as a DEXA scan. D-E-X-A is, uh, is the acronym. It's a very, very long name, but essentially what it is is a full, what I think of as MRI of your body that shows you bone density, shows you location of uh, fat, whether it's subcutaneous or visceral, that is to say deeper or more, you know, uh, near the surface of our skin, uh, that surfacey fat, that subcutaneous fat is healthier. Uh, the deeper fat is more dangerous for our health. So a DEXA scan, while uh, for some people it would be really difficult to, because it's a truth teller, right? It shows you everything. Yeah. Uh, but it's a tremendous amount of uh, valuable information that will help folks again. Get a baseline. This is where I am. This is my true body fat or body comp composition percent. This is where that body fat is. This is what my bone density is. Uh, and then you, with those those numbers, you can then move forward. I think that, that, that yeah, I, there's a couple of things there, Al. I think the one thing I that, that I've experienced doing, you know, exercising myself and all of that, and and listening to my clients that that go through this period that. that the enjoyment is there right they actually enjoy this so if you if you're not working anymore or you're working less i talk a lot about you know retaining purpose and passion social connections is one of the biggest predeterminants towards happiness and and everything you know exercise gives us an ability to enjoy something look forward to something and have some sort of social interaction with others maybe as you said in a yoga class or coaching or whatever that looks like so i i think that the enjoyment factor is yeah. is is, yeah. is part part of this as well right you, you you're actually yeah. um you know you've got some structure in your and and you're and yeah. you're looking forward to to what you're doing um, you know dan it's so funny in this in this day and age right i mean there's so little that we have control over Arguably, mm. we have very little control over anything that's happening in our world. So to your point, you know, when you embark on something and you can get a little bit of consistency with it as far as exercise is concerned, it's tremendously empowering. 
you know, we, we feel like, okay, I'm taking control mm. and it can be enjoyable and it should be enjoyable. And the effort itself is a great reducer of stress. It's a great counter, you know, counterbalance to the innate, or I should say natural stressors that typically occur, especially in this day and age with the news cycle and everything else associated with it. So, yeah, man, it, it's, it's, uh, if we can just keep it going long enough, we can reap the benefits of all of the good feelings mm. that usually happen after the initial trepidation about doing it in the first mm. place. And, and is one of the keys to consistency there, Al, the fact that you, you've talked a lot about the foundational stuff, but if you know where you're starting from, then, and, 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 and you can see those incremental improvements along the way that only adds to your want and desire to be consistent. I see a lot of people will just kind of, you know, just go to the gym or go and do this. And I'm not saying that that's not a good thing. Doing something is better than doing nothing, obviously. But in my opinion, with, with most things in life, if you know the truth from where you're starting at, then you can really truly progress and do things. And that keeps you going back for more. And there's, you know, the research out there that says it takes 66 days to make something a habit, you know, and yeah. if you, 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 and, and so I think, I think one of the things I will say for people listening and, and one of the things I've really taken away from this conversation is don't be afraid of the truth, you know, start, you know, start where you're at and it doesn't matter where you're at, find out where you're at, and then just improve from there because that's only going to add to you wanting to do it and enjoying it more. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, I couldn't agree more, Dan. You know, one of my favorite quotes, and it's in the book, I think it was Gloria Steinem who said it, the truth will set you free, but first it'll piss you off. You know, um, it, it's, it, it's all about those, uh, yeah. you know, setting that baseline and embracing where you are. And, and mm -hmm. to your point, you know, I have a, a gentleman that I've been working with who, uh, who was quite significantly overweight when we started working together. And I knew uh, because of a variety of factors that his levels of systemic chronic inflammation was quite high. Uh, and in part that comes from uh, the fat as well, which tends to spit out a lot of damaging uh, chemicals into the body, which are inflammatory. Uh, and one of the most important markers, as I mentioned earlier, for me uh, in terms of chronic uh, disease is mark, you know, is, is monitoring systemic or chronic inflammation. But I was able to, you know, we got that baseline. He looked at that number. It scared him to death, which is to say C-reactive protein, which is a marker for uh, systemic chronic inflammation. Uh, and he was, he was really saddened to see how high it was initially. Uh, but we have dropped that number like dramatically. In fact, I, I think I uh, posted at one point on LinkedIn about it and I shared his numbers and it's totally changed his outlook. He had a positive one anyway, but when he could see that progress, you know, and really know that the changes he was making was working, you know, that he moved that number from one that, you know, was, was very dangerous to one that's within a normal range. Uh, he knew he's on his way and, and there, you can't put a price on that, you know? I, I, absolutely. I think, and, and also one of the things that really strikes me again, all, all of my work that I do around um, uh, kind of around us as human beings and, and what makes us tick is the sense of achievement, right? What, one of the, one of the things that often um, a, a, an unsuccessful retiree or a retiree that doesn't enjoy their retirement will say um, is that they have they they don't achieve much. They can't achieve. They had a, a career of achievement, stepping up the ladder of doing things, um, and we get to a point actually where human beings are wired for more. Right, this kind of this sense of enough is not something that we kind of we like to move forward and achieve. And I just think you know, getting to a point where there's something staring right in front, staring right in you know right right in front of us that we can go actually we can achieve things. You know, losing weight, dropping body fat, dropping crucial numbers, getting our bloods back better. All of that will absolutely play into us as human beings and a sense of personal achievement and pride, which I think gives us more energy and more um, health span and everything that we um, that, 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 that we talked about before. You know, I, I couldn't agree more. And uh, to be very honest with you, Dan, um, you know, and I'm going to be honest here, uh, I, I look around at, you know, folks my age and older. And, you know, to your point, we do latch on to the 
to the material possessions we've, you know, accumulated, right? Whether it's a beautiful home, a, a nice car, uh, some career achievements, perhaps building a business, all of the things that I know many of our listeners can relate to. But when I look around, um, I think to myself, you can't take it with you. And all of those things, when they're built on, you know, uh, a platform of what I believe is ill health or some degree of ill health, um, I shake my head because I go, it, 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 you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. And, you know, I, I think back, I think back to my mom's passing in mean, this past week, there were so many things that she had that were important to her, that are important to all of us, you know, uh, and other people would laugh at what she thought was important. And we, and we all have our things, but when she became, you know, uh, truly terminally ill, uh, none of those things were important to her anymore. And, uh, the, the truth is that she passed without any of them. Um, and I think that's, that's, if I could, if I could walk up to every person, you know, and I'd say, you know, it, I mean, you have a beautiful home, but you and I know you're not healthy in the way that you need to be. Uh, can we talk honestly for a moment here? Yeah, yeah. Because listen, and this is true. This is really true for, for people in the 30 to, to 25 to 45 age group, because at that point, their habits haven't really manifested in the kinds of what I think of as the indignities of aging. They're coming, but it hasn't happened yet. Mm. Uh, and I want to shake those people and go, if you don't change now, you know, it's going to be so much harder to change later. And, you know, you're not feeling it. You're not experiencing it now, but you will. Mm. You know, you got to wake up. Yeah. Uh, look, what's the point in working for it all if you can't? And And so... Uh, let me define this. What's the point in working for it all where you accumulate some level of financial wealth and then you get to a point where you can spend your money and your time on stuff? What's the point if, of doing all of that if you can't take advantage of your time and therefore the money that you've worked with? I think that is you know, fundamental to, 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 to making sure that people do um, – that people do start to think about this very differently as they as, as they approach their retirement. You know, um, I don't I don't know whether this is actually true or not, but it's reputed to be true that Steve Jobs, who passed at fifty six from pancreatic cancer, uh, was quoted as saying that he could pay anybody to do anything for him, but he couldn't pay anybody to be sick for him. Hmm. And I believe he passed with about $7 billion uh, in, you know, net worth. So hmm. I think, you know, whether or not he actually said that, I know for a fact that he was well aware that it seemed like anything was possible for him, hmm. Hmm. Um, except that he could have someone else be sick. sick. Yeah, 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 him. yeah, absolutely. Um, Al, as we, it's been such a fascinating conversation. I've got one last question I want to ask you, if that's all right with you, and then we'll um, we'll wrap things up. But you, I think you might already be living it. But what does Al Lyman's second half look like? You, what, what, what are you? What, what does it? What does life look like for you over the next twenty, thirty years? If you can, uh, if you can think that far ahead. Well, I, you know, I think, uh, I think that far ahead, uh, every day, I, I always think, you know, we, we want to try to reverse engineer our life as much as we possibly can. I'll tell you, Dan, um, you know, I've had a, a, a an incredibly rewarding we, uh, career as a musician. Uh, I continue to perform, um, with our local, uh, symphony here in uh, Venice on the Gulf coast of Florida. Um, I've had a long career, more than 25 years as an endurance sports coach, uh, coaching folks to Ironman finishes. I coach a five-time Ironman age group world champion um, who is from Norway. Um, but as I sit here at 64, I'm embarking on this aging coaching, as you mentioned earlier, coaching aging and aspiring adults to take back control of their health and live stronger in their second half. So as I sit here right now at 64, I've got my book and I feel like, Dan, I haven't even gotten started. I feel like I'm just beginning. 
when most people, or at least a great percentage of people my age are thinking, man, I can't wait to enjoy my retirement. I don't know what that means exactly. But uh, to me, I feel like, you know, I got a lot to prove. I don't know what's going on. The second is, uh, along with that, is I have two grandchildren, uh, Theo and Josie, five in a year and a half. I have two children. One, uh, those two grandkids are uh, my daughter's uh, two children. Um, and I, uh, I'm so excited about the prospect of, of uh, running around in the yard with those kids as they grow, racing my grandson, Theo, you know, from here to the stop sign, you know, when he's 15 and, uh, you know, I'm 74. Um, I'm looking forward to the day and I'm planning for it, Dan, when I can be at their wedding. Uh, and not just uh, someone in a wheelchair sitting in the back of the room, but participating, uh, leading the dance uh, in the middle of the floor. Um, and then, uh, you know, God willing, um, maybe be around for the, the birth of their children. And, and again, repeat the process of running around in the yard with them. This is my this is my vision. This is the dream that I have. And of course, it's a mystery. We don't know what's going to happen, but. I try to live every day giving myself the best opportunity. And I'll, I'll say one additional thing because we haven't really delved into this yet. And I'm sure your listeners are thinking, oh, Al, you know, you, you everything's easy for you. Uh, and it's all about being perfect. And, you, you know, you've done all of this all your life. Well, you're not me. I want to make sure everybody knows this is not about and has never been about perfection. I eat hamburgers. I, I occasionally uh, you know, snack on foods I shouldn't be. There are occasional days where I come like, ah, I don't feel like working out today. All of those things happen. Uh, and, but when I make those choices, they happen very intermittently. It's not frequently. But I always know I've got my baseline of lifestyle, you know, how I live, the way I, the way I think. So I always can come back to it. So it is not and never will be about perfection. It's really about a lifestyle transformation where we can at least give ourselves the best uh, chance to create those memories that that I know uh, are important to all of us. Just as you alluded to earlier, you know, humans want that next thing. Uh, I know we're all trying. We, we all, we all want to be the best version of ourselves, and we all want to have this opportunity uh, to live stronger in our second half. Al, what a wonderful place. This has been such an amazing conversation. Um, thank you so much for, for, for your time. I think um, the links to all your, your book, Age Well and Feel Great, um, I'm going to order it and I'm going to link it into the show notes. Your, um, your blogs are amazing. I've read a number of them. Your newsletter, the Age Optimizer newsletter, I'll put that in there. I encourage all the listeners to, to visit your website have a look through your content, subscribe to the stuff, view the webinars, et cetera. Because uh, I think it's such a, a wonderful resource that fits so perfectly in with the work that, that that I do. But for anybody that's approaching the second phase of their life and thinking about retirement, this is fundamental. This is as foundational as thinking about how much money do you need? How much money do you need? How much health do you need? Are both equally as actually probably health is more important than money right let's get there so um the foundational stuff around around health is so important so um i encourage anyone to 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 do and to to, to reach out to you as well if if they feel like they can um have any questions etc so al thank you so much for this conversation it's been so enlightening and thank you for your time and your knowledge and your wisdom and condensing kind of 30 years of all of that into a, an hour's conversation. I do yeah. really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for your kind words. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share what, uh, you know, what I've learned. Um, I, uh, you know, I'm honored to be here with you and yeah, I would certainly encourage any listeners that are looking to take control of their health to reach out. Uh, there's nothing that makes me happier than to have a positive impact on the lives of others uh, and help folks to, you know, to live their best life and live stronger in their second half. So uh, thank you so much for what you're doing and for the opportunity. I appreciate that. Thanks. And and uh, the last thank you is for everyone listening. So thank you, everyone, once again, for tuning in to the Humans versus Retirement podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure, as always, to have you along with me today. Until next time, take care.